opportunity. Um, so let's get started. Um, these are my disclosures. So natural history of pulmonary embolism and why is this a topic of discussion? Obviously because there is a significant morbidity and mortality associated with it. And I think what we are just embarking on over the past several years uh, is just our beginnings of understanding of what it is uh, that leads to patients uh, to have this increased mortality. And certainly, when we talk about pulmonary embolism, there's lots of different variants of this. And what we're going to focus on really is going to be the massive pulmonary embolism uh, and submassive to some degree. Now, PE is associated with increased morbidity and mortality, especially in patients that have cardiovascular risks. Um, my screen is flickering. If you, thank you. Uh, and, and of course, the focus of this discussion, I'm sure today and uh, as we move on, will be uh, will be not necessarily on the standard PEs that patients have, which the treatment is anticoagulation and the mortality for that with, a, with uh, asymptomatic PEs or PEs with a little bit of RV strain, et cetera, is minimal. What we want to focus our discussion really on is that submassive to massive pulmonary embolism that can actually have catastrophic events. And any one of us who have treat, treated patients, I don't think that did anything. Um, any one of us that have treated patients with this recognize that there's an uncertainty in this uh, when patients come in that are at that cusp of having profound shock. Now, there are categorizations of how we even determine whether a PE is a standard PE that is, doesn't have hemodynamic collapse, so one that has uh, RV strain, et cetera, to another that you know the patient's gonna die right in front of you, and what truly are the treatment modalities that are available. The bottom line is, when you have a pulmonary embolism, to recognize a PE, the tests are fairly simple. Just about everybody gets a CTA. All the other modalities that we grew up uh, doing and using to diagnose PEs are long gone. Uh, and, and really, with, on the basis of CTA, the next things we look at right away are our ability to appreciate through an echo and or even through a CT measurement today, RV strain and the effect of hemodynamics, tachypnea, respiratory issues with the patients. And oftentimes, it's the hemodynamic collapse that really uh, leads us to make some decisions as to what to do, what not to do. Submassive PE, by definition, is one that says sustained hypertension, so solid blood pressure less than 90 for at least 15 minutes, requiring, uh, with or without inotropic support, but certainly we get into a process of not wanting to start inotropic support, rather going down the path of uh, reducing the clot burden so the strain on the heart can improve and the pressures can improve. And of course, the submassive PEs are without that hemodynamic collapse, but with RV strain. And it's somewhat also dependent on troponin leaks. Sometimes it's also dependent on just our ability to gauge how the patient is doing from a standpoint of uh, tachypnea requiring oxygenations and all those kind of things. The problem here is that we'd never know when a submassive PE is going to evolve into a massive PE. And we recognize that the lar single largest cause of death in patients who even come in with submassive PE is either autothrombosis that continuously occurs beyond a clotted point, uh, be beyond an embolus, and or recurrent PEs that are occurring as we're starting the patients on anticoagulations and all those things before they even reach therapeutic goals. And there's a litany of things that we do to manage this. Um, and, and to be frank, I think all discussion of all this is probably beyond the scope of just one talk. But this has been an evolution. And the reason there's a litany of things that we do is because we don't have a clear grasp on what works best, uh, just, like, uh, just like it usually does in, in intervention world. So what's the physiologic effect uh, we want to achieve uh, from a thrombolysis, mechanical, and or giving uh, TPA, et cetera, is to improve the clot resolution. We want to reduce the pulmonary arterial pressures. We want to improve lung perfusion. And we want to improve right ventricular strain. What the short and long-term implications of that improvement in RV strain is, I think still remain to be determined. And there's a lot of work that's uh, going on in us understanding this. Thrombolysis does reduce the burden, but it's associated with risks. Uh, if you're over the age of 75, the risk of bleeding is clearly high. In females, the risk of bleeding is high. And even if you're under the age of 75, the risk of bleeding, and bleeding obviously occurs in other places, not necessarily from the access sites. So we have to make sure the patient do not have an underlying reason to bleed, especially uh, get a head CT if you're going to do uh, prolonged thrombolysis in anybody. Um, the idea behind catheter-directed therapy is pretty well established. We have to get access. We have to get into the clot burden. And whether we do mechanical aspirations, whether we do ECOS catheter, whether uh, we do suction thromboembolectomies, 
and or simply start TPA lysis. All these things are being evaluated, unfortunately not necessarily in a constructive way that we have well-defined parameters that we're evaluating. So I think, I think we have a long way to go until we can come up with some better understanding of what to do and what not to do. What's interesting is that if you look at the results of catheter-directed therapy, most series will show that there is clot resolution to some degree, uh, and you do have uh, improvement in hypoxia and other things, and that's what we gauge our efforts by because we take patients that truly need this. Those are the patients that are truly collapsing. All we want to do is improve their hemodynamics. We're not there to hit a home run. We simply want to make them better and continue thrombolytics uh, well beyond that initial stage and see what happens in the next 24, 48 hours. As a matter of fact, Earlier reports um, simply showed that people parked a pigtail catheter, went into, uh, even into the IVC in proximity to the uh, RV and simply started lysis and that works pretty well. Our thought process on RV strain has improved. Uh, RV dysfunction is commonly seen with some massive PEs, but with massive PEs it's almost always seen and this is what leads to that hemodynamic collapse. And we know that thrombolysis uh, with TPA reduces the RV strain. Many studies have shown that what the short and long-term gain with that is, I think is pretty ill-defined, but we clearly understand that there is a benefit in improving uh, that RV strain. I'm a vascular surgeon, I'm not a cardiologist, so I work with cardiologists who then subsequently follow these patients, but I have treated many of such patients, and you can see how they improve over time. Patients who get aggressively treated versus who do not, from a standpoint of what they can do or what their disabilities are in short and long-term to follow. Um, and there are lots of studies, prospective single arm multicenter trial with ECOS catheter that showed that there's a clear benefit of mechanical and uh, TPA uh, thrombolysis. Um, I won't bore you with some of this, but I think what I do want to share with you is that um, one of the limitations in all these studies is that as these studies were being done, single and multicenter, uh, the problem has been that the parameters of evaluation were ill-defined. So we truly don't understand what works, what doesn't, but we do know that beyond anticoagulation, especially in patients with massive pulmonary embolism, actively going in to do clot resolution uh, to improve RV strain, to improve hemodynamic collapse uh, does work. And for, for many of us who have treated these patients, we know it works. And this is kind of like a ruptured aneurysm scenario where a person's going to bleed to death until you stop the bleeding by doing an endograft or open aneurysm repair. This is very comparable and the effects are very profound and you see them right away. There's a litany of studies and meta-analyses that have done. Once again, they all tend to have some limitations because the parameters of evaluation were ill-defined. And on the basis of this, Mike Jaff with a lot of other uh, authors um, came up with a tentative uh, algorithm trying to address how to treat these patients. And once again, for uh, simple PEs, anticoagulation is the treatment of choice. For patients with submassive PE with RV strain, anticoagulation is the treatment of choice unless they then can develop or do develop any uh, signs of shock and other things. And then maybe there's role for um, TPA and certainly mechanical thromboembolectomies uh, and or lysis uh, are treatments that are evolving. So with that, I'm going to take you through uh, one little movie uh, slide of trying to tell you, uh, trying to show you uh, how we have managed some of these catastrophic patients that come in with significant strain. So here's, if you can lower the volume, that would be great, please. Uh, so here's a 54-year-old woman who came in right ankle fracture, standard stuff. She was in a cast. All of a sudden, she became very tachypneic, had a massive pulmonary embolism. As a matter of fact, her husband said she was standing in the kitchen and she just collapsed. And he caught her. She was a little bit heavy woman. He caught her, but he couldn't catch her enough that her but still landed on the floor and she woke right up and I think she had a saddle pulmonary embolism that fragmented and you can see that on this CTA. So what was a massive PE, a massive clot burden was a saddle embolism that fragmented uh, is what we started with. There was significant right and left um, clot burden as you see in this. RV LV ratio was 2.45 at presentation. You can actually even appreciate some of that on the CTA. I don't have the echo results here for you. Quickly got her to the interventional suite. And in her case, the anesthesiologists were uh, very afraid to even intubate her because of simply the auto peep effect of us uh, having a collapse and she could have probably died right away. So she, we simply just nursed her uh, with face mac and oxygenation. But you're seeing here's a clot burden that's completely uh, obstructing the main right and left pulmonary arteries. In these cases, if we pass big catheters and wires to uh, aspirate that clot, the reality is those six, seven, eight French systems 
Uh, when they elbow the uh, right ventricle to go into the pulmonary arteries, it can obviously cause tachyarrhythmias. And in this particular case, these things were happening. This was the first case that I had done like this, simply with a five French catheter go in. And imagine if that embolism is really brie cheese. Imagine that, that just completely clogging the drains there. And uh, what we did here is simply take a Berenstein catheter glide wire, infuse some TPA, as you see there, and simply poke holes in that brie cheese and trying to get to a point where we can resolve some of the clot and reduce the RV strain. Uh, and that's pretty much what you're doing. There's simply a glide wire with a Berenstein catheter in all directions. So once again, simply try to improve some outflow in this patient who had a pulse pressure of four. She had a complete hemodynamic collapse. Uh, and with that, uh, what I ended up doing over a 1-4 system is using very small, these are four millimeter balloons, uh, mostly within the main trunk of the pulmonary artery, certainly not going distal into the smaller pulmonary arteries and just doing simple balloon angioplasties. Once again, simply to improve the outflow uh, and then we can deal with the rest. And it was amazing how fast and rapid that worked. As soon as that brie cheese pattern started to appear more like a Swiss cheese, uh, her hemodynamic situation improved dramatically. So this was just one such case. We've done several like this now uh, and this is a completion angiogram that you guys are seeing uh, to follow, I think. So I think we're all struggling with finding good solutions to this, uh, and I think these are situations where we just need to sometimes think outside the box. This patient did very well, uh, improved right away. Uh, we lysed her for 24 hours, parked her in the ICU. This is her fresh post-op, looked like she was gonna die just before, I can tell you. Everyone with a massive PE looks like this. This is two weeks in my office that she came to see us and she's resumed normal activities. So, thank you guys.